Good morning, good day, and good evening. I am, as always, your host, Brody Robertson. And today, we have someone on who I'm sure is going to get me in trouble with some of the stuff that we talk about a bit later. Uh, welcome to the show, Rygard from the Factorio team. Uh, you may recognize him from the article that I talked about a few weeks ago where he was talking about improving support for Wayland. But he's also been involved in Factorio modding. That is what he did before he was working there. And if you go to his GitHub, you will find his dot .files uh, repo. And he's very clearly a Linux user if you look at some of the applications he has in the dot .files repo. So welcome Just to the show. Bit. Oh, Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you. So, I guess, if you want to just explain more about your background, anything that I might have skipped over there, or if, or if you feel like that was a reasonable enough, like, base explanation. Yeah, um, I mean, my name is Caleb, otherwise known as Ragard. Um, I've been working for the Factorio team for just a bit over a year now. Mm -hmm. um, I primarily focus on the Linux support, as well as the core engine development. Okay, fair enough. Um, so... I guess probably the best place to start is sort of how did you get yourself involved in Linux in the first place? Yeah, that's a bit of an interesting story. Um, everyone has their story about how they switched to Linux originally, whether it be, oh, I got tired of Microsoft's ads being pushed on me or yada yada. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a little bit different. Uh, my initial drive into Linux was actually because I wanted to use the Kakoon text editor. Have you heard of Kakoon before? Yes, I have. I had planned to do a video on that ages back, but I don't think I've ever got around to it. Yeah, you should. It's it's an interesting editor. Um, mm -hmm. It does not support Windows because it relies on a bunch of Unix and POSIX specific things. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically POSIX, it requires a POSIX environment to work mm -hmm. because of the way it's designed, and Windows is not a POSIX environment. So, so yeah. I... Uh, yeah, I switched to Linux because of that. Mm -hmm. What did you... Like, so when did that happen? It happened... Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, 2020... 2020. Yeah, 2020. 2020, okay. Were you aware of Linux before that and just hadn't tried it out? Or was it like you were just discovering it then? I was aware of Linux before that. I didn't want to use it because I thought I wanted to play games, but... As it turns out, I don't play many PC games, so... You just uh, make mods and make games instead. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing with me is I tend to get hyper-focused on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, it was Minecraft, and mm -hmm. then when, when I was 17, I found Factorio, mm -hmm. and it's been a love-love relationship ever since. <laughs> so what was the, uh, the first distro that you actually swapped to? Uh, the first one I tried was Zorin OS, because okay. it looked nice. Uh, it's based on Ubuntu, mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't last for very long. I eventually switched to Manjaro mm -hmm. because I also thought it looked cool. And then what, the first time Manjaro broke on me, I switched to Arch. And only recently <laughs> did I switch away from Arch to Fedora. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So you're, is it Fedora Gnome, Fedora KDE? What do you want? It's gonna... Fedora Gnome okay. uh, because I like Gnome's built-in apps more. Mm -hmm. Like, they're cleaner. But mm -hmm. I'm actually considering switching to all the KDE ones just because... Gnome. <laughs> so well, not yeah. Yeah, I, I, we, we're definitely gonna get more into that a bit later, but I do want to say that I do like the polish that Gnome has. I, I think their app UX is really nice, yes. and I think the desktop is really well polished. It's the problem is the the stuff that's like not present that is the issue. Precisely, I love the way I love the theme that they have going on, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't like how restrictive it is so yeah. like i use sway myself and the no maps kind of there's a lot of jank around that that i have i have to like have a script that imports all the gtk settings because it doesn't work properly right. stuff like that mm -hmm. so you mentioned that you swapped because of uh Kahoon. how did you even become aware of that application then if you were a windows user was it like a random youtube video you saw or i think it was a shoot what's his name i can't remember the guy's name there was a youtube video i saw about Kahoon. Uh, I I feel bad for oh DistroTube. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, DistroTube four years ago made oh uh, yeah I guess that lines up four years ago he made a video about Kakoon, mm -hmm. and I'd been interested in Linux for a while but I really wanted to try this weird text editor so mm -hmm. I said well may as well jump ship. Well, on that note then, are you actually still using Kakoon or do you use something else every okay. day? Okay. Yeah, okay. I use it for work. 
Hmm. I I think you were the first Kakoon user I've actually run across. There's not many of us. The Discord server has like 200 people in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, what actually sold you on that then? Because I, I kind of want to hear more about this text editor. The tagline of it is it's Vim but backwards. So in Vim, you have C-I-W for change inside word or change around word, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. You have the verb and then noun. Mm -hmm. Kakoon is the other way around. You have the noun and then verb. So you can essentially think of it as Vim, but always in visual mode. Okay. So instead of C-I-W, you do Alt-I-W-C. Okay, okay. Huh. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to refine your selection before you commit to changing something. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can select the whole document, then you can press S, which uh, selects sub-selections within your selection. So you can type like S and then search for all occurrences of the, the word. And then you hit enter, and then you can change those. Mm -hmm. But if that's not exactly what you wanted, you can undo your selection and do something else. And it's all very visual and interactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what sort of language interaction like tooling exists around Kakoon? Because I know like Vim's been really developed for a long time. You can get a lot of nice things working. But I don't actually know what the ecosystem around Kakoon is like. The Kakoon ecosystem is not nearly as big as you might imagine. Uh, it's very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very well-made LSP integration, mm -hmm. which is pretty much all I need. I, so I use the Kakoon, I use the LSP. There's also a bunch of other things. Uh, if you've heard of the Primogen's Harpoon plugin for NeoVim, mm -hmm. uh, I made a Kakoon version of that because I really liked how it worked and I wanted it for myself. But other than that, it's usually just, it's usually the plain experience for me. Mm -hmm. What does that, uh, that plugin do? Because I've not used it. It allows you to pin certain files. So for example, if I'm adding a new entity to Factorio, I can pin the entities class file. Mm -hmm. Then I can pin like the Lua definitions class file. Uh, and then I can quickly switch between them using alt one and two and three and four and stuff like that. Okay. So it's, it just lets you pin certain buffers to a, a convenient hotkey so you can get back to where you were originally after you go through a long go to definition chain. Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay, that it's been makes, very nice. Yeah, that does make it sound like really, really simple to use because I guess like you because I, I use uh, VS Code to do my code stuff. I I, it, I use I, I use VS I use VS Code with a NeoVim plugin. So there you go. You know, I forgive you. Um, you can I guess do similar things in VS Code because it does always show like all of your tabs along the top. But I guess having a very quick way to just find a hotkey to jump right back and forth actually would make that considerably easier. I've always felt like I should properly sit down and actually learn NeoVim. Like, I, I, I know the basics of it, and I feel more comfortable when I'm editing in NeoVim, but I don't really use a lot of the additional functionality, and I guess that's part of the reason why I never properly sat down and used Kakoon either. Like, I don't know. I, I, I totally get it. I see people who are really big on editors like this or like Emacs who have everything down to individual hotkeys and know exactly what they need to press to do every single operation. And it seems more efficient. It's just a matter of, you know, getting to the point where you don't have to think about any of the syntax. It's like, you know, when you get really familiar with a language, right? Where you're like a programming language where you're no longer looking up what does this function mean? What does this function take as arguments? How do I use this? What What is this library? What is that library? You have a innate understanding of how all these pieces fit together and you can just hack on it and not really think about it. And I'm sure when you get an editor to that state as well, it just becomes second nature for anything you want to do. Precisely. The whole idea is to decrease the amount of friction between your brain and the code. Mm-hmm. So in my case, uh, uh, the base setup is pretty good for that. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, they want something where, hey, I can click here to go here. And I don't fault anyone for using the tool that suits them best. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be one of those people who says, oh, you have to use Kaku and everything else is garbage. Even though I made that joke earlier, I wasn't serious <laughs> about it. Uh, use whatever is the best tool for you. And if you really want to try to get into these more niche things like Vim or Emacs or Kaku, mm -hmm. then give it a shot. How long did it take you to get comfortable with it? I had used NeoVim for a couple months before, so the idea of a modal editor wasn't new. Mm -hmm. But it definitely took some adjusting to get used to doing everything backwards. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for Kakoon, it was designed very sensibly. Like, 
everything is very orthogonal and makes sense. Uh, there's a lot of keys that are uh, mnemonic is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fairly consistent throughout the editor. Uh, one of my main complaints with Vim that m led me to like wanting to try Kakoon was Vim is mostly mnemonic, but there are a lot of things under the G key that you just have no idea what's going to happen. And it makes no sense. And it's just an accumulation of cruft over the last several decades of work yeah. that they can't get rid of because it would break everyone. Well, my favorite is the, my favorite bit of cruft with Vim is the core bit of cruft, HJKNL. People over the years have come up with reasons why HJKNL is so great, you know, home row and all that. But the original reason for it is because of the keyboard that Vi was, uh, was initially, was it? No, before Vi. No, no. No, it was Vi. Okay, I'll, yeah, Vi is the reason why the hotkeys exist, not EX or Ed. Yeah, so Vi was made on a keyboard where the arrow keys were an alt key on HJKNL. And that's the reason why it's there, because it made sense on that keyboard, but people are just used to that now. That is the thing that you use Vim for. You know, everyone knows Vim, HJKNL, and there's not really a reason to change it now that people have got these other reasons around it. But I guess that makes sense with the mnemonics as well, where you have the core mnemonics that make sense, you know, change, you know, things like that. But yeah, at some point you run out of keys to do mnemonics. So it's kind of just like you have to fit them in there where they, wherever you can get them. Yeah, precisely. On another note, I just looked at my Kakoon configuration mm. and I just realized it's a thousand lines long. So I guess I'm not using the vanilla ad after all. There's a lot of plugins in here I forgot I had. <laughs> I guess that's. A... I need to do a rewrite, I guess. Would you actually use the plugins or do you not even remember what they, what they were? Oh, no. Now that I'm looking through them, I forgot that they weren't a part of the editor. Ah, okay. Like there's auto pairs is not built into the editor, but mm. I have it. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, that's one yeah, of the... it's... Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, that's that's one of the reasons why it's always... I, I always question whether or not you should use one of these, like, NeoVim distributions where, you know, they'll include a bunch of additional plugins, a bunch of different configurations by default, rather than starting from something from scratch and then building up from there. Because if you are starting with a big distribution, it can be hard to differentiate what is NeoVim, or in Kakoon's case, what is Kakoon, and what is something additional added to it. And there's nothing wrong with using additional things. I used plugins when I was using NeoVim fairly actively. It's just, if you want to start modifying things, it's pretty important to know where things are actually coming from. Exactly. And like I said before, uh, Use the tool that's best for you, not the thing that you think is the coolest. Mm -hmm. I switched from Arch to Fedora because I was sick of setting things up from scratch every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted things to just work. Mm -hmm. That is a, you know, that's a fair enough reason. I, I get that. That it said, I still uninstall, like, I don't uninstall GNOME, but I disable it and switch to Sway instead because I just can't <laughs> live without Sway anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. So when did you say you got into Factorio? A Factorio, I got into in 2017. It was right after a pretty major alpha release. Mm -hmm. uh, the story there is all of my older brothers, mm -hmm. I have five of them, were into Factorio at the mm -hmm. time. And they were doing a LAN party for this new release. And I was looking at them and I said, Imagine. this looks like a fun game. Mm -hmm. So they went and downloaded one of the DRM free copies from our website and put it on my computer. And mm -hmm. I joined their LAN game and played it for way too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was how I got into the game. So for anyone who is unaware of what Factorio is, um, I guess just briefly explain it and like what, what the goal is in the game. For sure. Factorio is a, an automation game. It actually ended up spawning an entire genre of games. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal of the game is you're stranded on an alien planet and you are trying to build a rocket to escape the planet. Mm -hmm. and, but in order to do that, rockets are very complicated. You need to build a factory to be able to build the rocket. So you start from scratch with raw resources and you have to keep building up technology chains and getting to the point where you can make like low, low density structures and plastics and then eventually get yourself into orbit. I like to describe Factorio as less of a game and more of a graphical flowchart. <laughs> I've seen that in other places. Oh, actually, I think it was from your video that I watched. Mm -hmm. 
because I've got the uh, I've got the 2016 gameplay trailer open right now, and well, don't watch that one. Uh, it was one of the ones linked on the website, so that's what I clicked. Um, Is it what? Hold yeah, on. What? There's the 2016 one and the 2020 trailer on the uh, homepage of the website. Huh. I guess we never updated that. <laughs> I'll ask someone to do that. Uh, we have a newer one that's the same trailer, but it looks better. Okay, let's see if we can find the new one then. Uh, this should just be trailer 2021, I think. Uh, Factorio 1.0 launch trailer? Uh, the one right next to that. Uh, trailer 2020. Maybe the... Is, yeah. I'm... Okay, that 2020. This is, okay, okay. Yeah, it was 2020. Sorry. My bad. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah, I... I, I, I look at this game, I'm like, this looks really cool, but I, <laughs> it hurts my brain to look at it for too long. Like, I, do, I, I get it, right? Like, if you, you're supposed to break it down into little pieces and it'll make sense, but, yeah, like, there's, there's just a lot going on. <laughs> One of my favorite YouTube videos is a video that likens Factorio to software engineering. And that is a very apt I've comparison. Because Factorio is like software engineering, but you don't have to deal with any of the bad stuff. Mm. You just get to build your factory and refactor whatever you want. And there's no deadlines. It's, it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Factorio teaches you software engineering. Seriously, I think that's the video you're talking about. Yes, I think that's the exact one. Mm -hmm. Where it like, does stuff with like spaghetti noodles and stuff. <laughs> it's pretty good. I think it's a really cool game, right? Like... I, it's it's really cool that like a whole sort of genre spawned off of it. Yeah, it's incredible. I get it, right? Like I I get it's not my my kind of game. I think it's really cool. <laughs> well, I mean, we have a free demo, so if anyone's interested in trying it out, uh, we can find it on our website. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll actually sit down and properly try to learn the game at some point. <laughs> or well, I'll just I don't know if you if you value your productivity, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> I I've kind of separated out my gaming time and my work time like i i don't usually play any games during the week it's only on the weekend that i do it and i like, i guess it depends on like what you what you want to do with your life and all that but for me that doing that sort of separation works yeah i mean this game is so addictive that we even have in our terms of service a line that says we are especially not responsible if you stay up all night playing factorio and miss your work or school deadlines <laughs> because this game is notorious for being addictive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i know firsthand how addictive it can be yeah you got so addicted that you started getting into modding yeah actually that's a great segue to that um i after two years of playing the game uh there were some things that i really didn't like about the game so i was like hey this game has a modding API. Let's see if I can fix some of the problems. So mm -hmm. I started modding in 2019. Uh, and now I've made two dozen mods because I just can't stop. Mm -hmm. So I guess what 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 did what did you want to change with mods? Like what what did you feel like was missing or should have been added? Yeah, just just generally what sort of mods do you have that are available? Most of my mods are quality of life mm -hmm. and utility mods. For example, uh, one of them is called train groups, which mm -hmm. means when you set a schedule on a train, you can add it to a group mm -hmm. and any other trains in that group will get the same schedule and any modifications will apply to all of them. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That's just a quality of life feature because you could do the same thing by copy pasting the schedule between all your trains, but right. it's a lot less convenient. So it's a really nice way to just be able to bulk do things like that. Mm -hmm. And fortunately in the upcoming update, uh, train groups are now part of the base game, so it's going to hmm. be available for everybody. It's things like that. Things that make the game easier, less friction, hmm. uh, are most of the mods that I've made. Right, right. I'm seeing things in here like uh, one from three years ago, better alert arrows, cursor enhancements, task lists, uh, pipe visualizer, a, a stat GUI. Is, is, is there still another stat GUI in the game? Because that seems like a pretty... Uh, we haven't added anything like that. No, okay. uh, you can get the you can get the uh, same information through the console, like mm. just slash evolution or something oh, like okay, that. But okay. this just makes it available all the time. Okay. So yeah, I, yeah, it's pretty much just all like making it. it I I don't know if I'd say the easier is the correct like way I would describe, it, but definitely less friction for sure. I I do think quality of life stuff is always important. Um, there's a. I, I guess it can be hard. It can be hard to see what quality of life stuff is important like if you're developing the game right 
you have a very deep understanding of how the game works. It's the same thing with any other software, right? You have a deep understanding of all of the intricacies of how things fit together. So it can be kind of hard to see where the rough edges are because you know to avoid those rough edges just innately because, you know, you are so familiar with the code base. So it's all it, it, it it's always useful to have someone who at that time, I guess you were outside of the uh, development of the game, who mm. can sort of see it from a different perspective. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's been a really great boon for having such a good modding integration. Mm -hmm. I would firmly believe that if we didn't have such a good modding API, Factorio would not be relevant today. Mm -hmm. Because the game is fun by itself, but there's a lot, a lot of content mods that expend the ex excuse me extend the replayability to practically infinite heights. Mm -hmm. There are some people I'm watching on Twitch uh, that have games of giant mod packs that are going for a thousand plus hours on a single game. It's Jeez. it can get quite ridiculous. Well, that's the same thing we you mentioned. You got really addicted to playing Minecraft when you were a teenager. It's the same thing with that, where the, there is a really good base game there, but there's only so much in the game. And when you've played that enough times, you know, unless your entire goal is just building fancy things, and I guess you know the same thing applies to Factorio, building more and more optimized uh, supply chains. But at some point, you know you want to do more. You want there to be a further tech tree to go down. You want there to be different routes you can take to get there. And the same thing applies to Minecraft, where because it has such a powerful modding community and powerful modding API, it's allowed that game to really stay not just relevant, but as massive as it's always been. And in some cases, that game's bigger than it ever was. Oh yeah, I think Minecraft's the single biggest video game ever made. It definitely sold the most copies, but you know, I, I don't know what their like current player count is. They don't publish those numbers. No, I don't pay attention anymore. Judging by, I know during during COVID things popped up like really high with like Minecraft YouTube. Oh yeah, COVID. I mean, COVID wrecked a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways that we could spend an hour talking about that by itself. But but it definitely made. Uh, it, and if you existed in a, a digital environment for a lot of things, especially games and media, like a lot of those, because people just had a lot more free time, there were a lot more people trying things out and a lot of things just got suddenly a lot more popular. Exactly. Uh, one thing about COVID that actually was a benefit for me mm -hmm. is I wouldn't have this job if COVID hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. Because before COVID, Wube, the company I work for, was not very into remote work at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, I think, just one that I can recall person who was working remotely and everyone else was in the office. Mm -hmm. But after COVID, uh, we realized that remote work works fine for us. So I'm able to work for them, even though they're in the Czech Republic and I'm in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have this job if that hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. So there's silver linings and everything. So once you'd been modding for a while, like how... How did you move from that to actually working at the company that makes the game? About nine months after I started modding, I actually applied to get access to the Factorio source code. Mm -hmm. This is a program that they offer where if someone has good enough reasons and uh, enough interest, they can gain access to the source code mm -hmm. and uh, be able to contribute things. Mm -hmm. uh, not very many people get it because you have to have pretty good reasons. Mm -hmm. But I said, hey, I'm here. I've made these mods. I want to add more modding features so I can make better mods. May I have access to the source code? And they said yes. So I've had access to the source code for many years before I got hired. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, a big boon for me getting hired because I had already interacted with pretty much everyone at the company by then. They already knew who I was. I'd already been, gotten familiar with the code base. So when I sent them my resume, they said, mm, okay. <laughs> like, wait, we didn't hire you already? Yeah. Uh, that's another interesting story. My reason for applying to the company was because their Linux developer had left. There was one person that was openly the Linux guy mm -hmm. who did all the Linux support stuff for many years, mm -hmm. but he eventually left the company to do other things. And so I saw there was an opening, even though there were no openings on the website, I knew that they were lacking a Linux guy and I didn't want the Linux support to go by the wayside. So that's why I sent in my application. Mm -hmm. So... How long had they been without like a Linux developer, or was it just like 
basically right after that guy had left. It wasn't right after. I think they were without a Linux developer for a year, but don't quote me on that. I don't remember exactly when the previous guy left, but mm -hmm. it was definitely in the back of my mind that whole time. Mm -hmm. I think the main reason I didn't do it immediately was because of imposter syndrome. Sure. And to be perfectly frank, I still suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it took a little bit. So during that period where they didn't have a Linux developer, were things starting to slide or like what was what was happening? Or is if there's things you can't say, obviously, like, yeah, you, you can ignore that. Oh, no, we're fine. Um, things weren't necessarily sliding, but as you know, uh, Linux is going through quite a bit of a revolution in recent years with Wayland and Pipewire and uh, all the other things that are starting to finally become good enough to use for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but Factorio didn't have a dedicated guy who could go through and actually make sure all of these things were supported. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to do it because... I have a laptop that has fractional scaling on its screen, and I couldn't play Factorio on it without uh, turning the screen scaling down because it would be blurry. Right, right. Well, the reason I bring up it's sliding is because, like, you know, there is this whole issue with um, dependencies when you have native applications where you need to make sure things are actually lining up correctly or things are going to mm -hmm. start breaking. And I know there are... I, there are things like a lot of things now that are statically linked, um, but you know, th there's always going to be some additional issues that happen just because you're making a native application. Yeah, for sure. Uh, th thankfully, we've had pretty good foresight. Our deployment servers use a pretty ancient version of DULIBC, so you can even run Factorio on CentOS if you want to. Uh, not that that matters anymore. What is the but... minimum Linux requirement right now for Factorio, if you happen to know? I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let's see if we can... I can look and see what version glibc it requires, though. Yeah, if you can, uh, if you know what that is, that that gives an indication. Well, I'm just running LDD on it, so we'll see. Uh, lib. No, nope, it doesn't tell me the version. Sorry, I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. But right now, you can pretty much run it on anything mm -hmm. that is reasonably up to date. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I expect a reasonably up to date thing to work. I just wanted to know if you could run some like. Oh, and also has all those dynamic dependencies. Right, right, okay. Yeah, that well, that's obviously the, the biggest thing. Um, so, okay, you got the job doing Linux support. Hmm. And you were the Linux... You're, you're just the Linux guy there now. So you're basically, like... I, how much... How, I did want to ask, like, how much control do you have over, like, what happens on the Linux side? Like... I assume there's obviously like somebody that's keeping an eye on what's happening, but like how like how how does this work for you? I pretty much have full free reign over what I do in terms of the Linux support. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we do have some sort of organizational method. Uh, we have a big Trello board where we have all the tasks we need to do, uh, and I'm expected to be working on those tasks, but. Mm -hmm. One thing, I think my favorite thing about working at this company is we're also encouraged to work on anything we see fit for the benefit of the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, that includes the Linux support. Uh, so I am able to dedicate time to that whenever I want, basically. Mm -hmm. So is Linux support your main role or is that just one of your additional roles? I'd say it's one of my primary responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We don't really have roles at the company. It's a very flat structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just a game programmer, and all of us programmers share that same Trello board, but we all have our specialties. For for example, if uh, someone wanted to, if someone has an issue with Linux, it goes to me usually. Right, right. right. Uh, if someone has issue with sounds, it goes to Danyani. If someone has issues with the Nintendo Switch version, it goes to Twinson. But mm -hmm. uh, overall, there's not like a, hey, you're just doing these things. It's, hey, do whatever we need you to do. Uh, Unless you need help with from someone else, then you can ask. Right. Okay. Because I know in earlier posts you have discussed um, like working on modding stuff as well. Yes, I think I forgot to mention that. Uh, I didn't mention it because I haven't been able to do that much. I've been so busy with my Linux and game engine side of the programming that mm -hmm. I haven't had much time to dedicate to the modding mm -hmm. support uh, in recent months. But I, that is something I intend to get back to once our uh, expansion pack is released. Oh, that's cool. So with the um with the whole modding support, is there like difficulty? Uh, di that's <laughs> that was really bad for us. Are there difficulties with making sure it works consistently across 
like each of the operating systems. So I know that you guys support. Well, you, there's a bunch of things you guys support now. Um, it, there's the I, obviously the Switch version is not going to have it, but Linux, Windows, and macOS. Is there the issues with making sure the mods are working consistently, or has it been abstracted out enough where it's mostly fine and doesn't need additional work? I'd say the modding API does add a lot of difficulty overall. In terms of platform support, the biggest hurdle was actually ARM versus x86. Because when you get on the low level, there's a lot of small differences. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, I might be getting these backwards, so correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But uh, one of the platforms will, when you overflow an integer, mm -hmm. will wrap around to zero. The other platform will clamp it to the max value. Oh. <laughs> so because Factorio is a deterministic game, mm -hmm. uh, everything has to match 100% between all clients or they get desynchronized and it kicks you out of a multiplayer game. So we had to go through a lot of uh, pain to make sure that uh, all of the overflow, what's the word for it? All the times overflow can happen, mm -hmm. we check them and we apply our custom code to make it the same mm -hmm. on all platforms. Because okay. otherwise you wouldn't be able to play multiplayer with someone on a different architecture. So that's all stuff handled within like the modding API itself. That's all stuff handled on the C++ side. In terms of mods, mm -hmm. mods have no access to the platform at all. They're completely sandboxed. Mm -hmm. They only have access to the stuff that we give them, and that's all completely platform independent. Okay, okay. I, I, that was going to be my next question. Whether I apologize. If... I kind of rambled on a bit. There. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> Ramble as much as you want. It means I talk less. Um, I was going to ask if, if I was writing a mod, would I need to worry about the different platforms, or am I just targeting the specific game? No, you don't need to worry about the platforms. All you need to worry about is making sure that you do the same thing on every client. Mm -hmm. uh, so as long as you don't do anything particularly stupid, you're you're okay. <laughs> okay, okay, that makes sense. I wasn't sure how like how I guess powerful and how well developed the API was, but that definitely definitely uh, makes things considerably easier. Yeah, one thing that's useful to know is like. There's two different kinds of modding. Mm. Minecraft mm. modding is basically a source code hack. Uh, they add their own source code on top of the Minecraft source code. Mm. Factorio's modding is an official API, mm. so it's all within Lua scripts, and they can't access the C++ portion at all. They can't change any of that behavior. Mm. So they're completely confined to what we allow them to do. Okay. So there are certain things that are just simply not possible to interact with using mods. Exactly. I guess that makes it a lot easier to ensure that multiplayer functions correctly then. Yes, because with Minecraft, mods can do whatever they want. So if someone writes a mod that r removes everything on your hard drive, then there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. But with Factorio, we just don't give you access to the hard disk. You can only require other Lua files. You can't even read like static text files or anything. That's mm -hmm. all completely not accessible to you. Actually, speaking of Lua, this is random tangent, but I do want to bring it up because it is cool every time I remember it. Um, with uh, with Super Giants games, all of their Lua scripts are just available in the uh, directory for their game, so you can just like read all of those, modify it. Like it makes modding that game incredibly easy. Yeah, that's the same with us. All of the Lua scripts are packaged with the game, mm -hmm. but they're not obfuscated in any way. Okay. Do you does that mean including whatever source uh, um uh, ever whatever comments are in there? Because that's always fun to have a, yes. have a read of. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we have many. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, there's one particular one. We have a we have a utility function in the core Lua library that uh has no purpose. So someone <laughs> wrote a comment above it up somewhere that says, "But why?" <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my favorite comment in the code base. <laughs> it's always fun to see like whatever internal discussions have been happening because they just didn't strip any of that stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> like the the Linux kernel is a, a good example of this. There is a website where uh it <laughs> you can search for the use of specific terms over the years and you'll see like the if you search terms like fuck or shit, like there'll be spikes at certain points. <laughs> Oh, have you seen the like Half Life uh, source code comments video? No, I haven't. I... That's the the watching the dwindling sanity of Half Life developers or something like that through their source code comments. It is an amazing video. <laughs> I'll definitely have to have to check that one out. Um... 
Also, I just found that function I was talking about <laughs> and I actually was wrong. It's not a comment, it's a log message. So every time someone uses this function, it puts into the game's log, but why? <laughs> That's even better. It's uh, even better. <laughs> there's a, um, was it, is it, is it the fast? Yeah, fa fast, fast inverse square root. That, yeah, uh, fast inverse square root. yeah th <laughs> where they've got part of it, like the part of the, like, known function is just commented out as second iteration this can be removed like why does this number exist what does this do yeah i, I think i remembered exactly uh, tell me how close i am it's a uh, uh evil floating point bit hack and then what the fuck yeah a uh, bit level awesome. hacking and then what the fuck and then oh, okay. there's some weird math float i don't even know what's going on here then first iteration and second iteration this can be removed, and that's commented out. <laughs> yep, that's classic classic software development right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, as I said, it's fun to be able to see, like, what's going on here. Like, it, it gives you a little bit of um, insight into things. I think a lot of people... A, a lot of people like to take themselves a little bit too seriously, right? Like, there's all, it's, it's nice to have a bit of fun with it, and... It, like, yeah, we're trying to make something good. We're trying to make it all work. But, you know, the people making it are people. And sometimes they, you know, are annoyed with something. Sometimes they have something funny to say. So it's always it's always nice to get a bit of insight into, like, what's going on there. Yeah, uh, that is something that I emphasized a while back as well on, in our community mm -hmm. is uh, we are just people. We try our best, but at the end of the day, there's only so much we can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes we take out our frustration in our comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, with the whole Linux support thing, when you first got started there, like, what did you... What, how, you had access to the source code already, obviously, but had you looked at the Linux support before then, or were you just, from that point, considering, okay, you know, what can be improved here? I didn't do much snooping around before I got the job. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a bit of an interesting fact is I didn't really know that much C++ when I got this job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot on the job. Uh, and that's part of why I still struggle with imposter syndrome. But uh, I didn't do much snooping around the Linux code because I didn't really know how much of it worked. I didn't know what was required. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that they told me was they didn't have anybody that was willing to spend time on it. Right. The best part about being a developer or the, the primary thing about being a software developer is you don't know everything. You go read the documentation and figure it out. Or you use Google or you use an AI or mm -hmm. a combination of the above to help you with writing your code. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a reality that a lot of people don't realize until they actually get a software development job. Mm -hmm. Is in university, you're not allowed to use Google. On the job, you use it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people joke about, like, oh, you know, what would we do without Stack Overflow? But yeah, legitimately, it's a very useful resource. Like, mm -hmm. yes, there, there are certainly issues with like directly copying code because of weird licensing stuff. But mm -hmm. as a, like, you don't have to just learn everything yourself. Like, you can, right? You can just read... Well, even if you're reading books, right? You're still learning from the experience of somebody else who's done that. Most people are not just going at a language and then blindly just writing things until it works. You're going to build off of what other people know, what other people have done before, and hopefully give yourself a quicker head start than the people that came before you. Yeah, precisely. Uh, for the Wayland stuff specifically, I didn't have to do much research into that mm -hmm. because I almost immediately figured out that all we needed to do was enable it in SDL. Mm -hmm. So fortunately for me, that was fairly easy, but I still needed to go to SDL and figure out why it wasn't just working when I built it originally. And figure, and then I that led into figuring out about the Wayland protocols and that they're defined in XML files and that I had to generate things with the Wayland scanner binary mm -hmm. and went from there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to piece things together. Uh, and being a platform support developer just means that you're willing to put in the time to do that and that you have the ability to test that on your own devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a that's a really big thing, where it's so you'll see a lot of a lot of games have, and I, I don't fault developers for doing this, but they'll go to some third party developer and then outsource their Linux support, and mm. for a very brief period of time, they have really good, really well working game, but because they've outsourced it and it was a one time thing, it then you know, slowly starts to slide a bit. They're not getting updates on the Linux side. No one's testing the Linux side. If you're starting to see dependencies start to break, and eventually you're in a situation where you pay for this Linux thing to be done, and it works great if you're running on Ubuntu 12.04, but we're on 24.04 now, and everything is completely busted. Precisely. If you want to support a platform... You need to do it an ongoing support. Mm -hmm. You can't just do it one and done. That's not how things work. Mm -hmm. Even on Windows, we constantly have little things that break, like Windows 11. I don't have any specific examples because I don't work on that, but yeah. uh, I'm sure some specific things broke with Windows 11, and we have to continue to update the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Linux is just... Because of how visible the dependencies are, I think it's it's a lot easier to see exactly... like. The regular user is going to notice a lot of things going wrong because of how many other applications on their system are going to be affected by these issues. Whereas Windows, you know, it's it's a bit more obfuscated, right? You install a Windows update and some things change in the background. What changed? I don't know what changed. Mm. That is something that a lot of developers have echoed that I've seen on the internet is Linux, to, Linux uh, users are responsible for most of your bug reports, but they also make the best bug reports mm -hmm. because they know exactly what their system is comprised of. Mm -hmm. Is it similar in the case of a Factorio then? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's some bug reports. I actually have quite, quite the stack of Linux bugs that I'm sitting on that I need to fix, but uh, I need to get back to that fairly soon. Mm -hmm. But all of them are usually like, hey, here's my here's my distro, here's my desktop environment, here's any weird garbage glibc versions I'm using. Uh, it's usually pretty good. In fact, I even have some people that give me core dumps, which is really awesome, which just is really nice because I can see exactly what the memory state was when it crashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... I, I guess because it, it, Linux users are just more used to having to make a bug report. Hmm. Most people have probably made at least a couple here and there. Even if they haven't, they have probably seen a couple and have an understanding of what, like, what sort of stuff that you would be looking for from it. I assume you guys have some sort of, I like, I don't know what your bug reporting system looks like to like to the user who's reporting, but I assume there's some sort of like specific text boxes for each section you wanted to be filled out. Actually, no. Okay. Uh, all of our bug reports are done on our forums. Oh. And there's a bug report section, and they just create a post. And okay. there's some bug report guidelines that they have to follow, but there's no like hard coded template that they need to do or anything. Uh, okay. Sometimes I wish there was, but it, there's not. Right. Okay. Okay. So they're just not looking at the existing bug reports, and it kind of just whatever whatever happens happens, I guess. Yeah. There's a lot of manual maintenance of that forum that has to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure with um with the Linux people, if you do ask them for additional information, it's probably a, a lot more of them are going to be familiar with how to get that information, like without having to be explicitly told, as opposed to on the Windows bug reports where again, most people just have never even considered having to add additional information. They, they might get a pop-up on some piece of software where their application crashes and it's like, what went wrong with the program? And you're like, I clicked this and it broke, and that's pretty much like what you you'll get. I'm sure there are I, I'm I'm sure there are people on the Windows side who are writing good bug reports, but I I can't imagine it's most of them. Yeah, I mean Windows doesn't really help you because you get a blue screen and it just says ah oh, snap something went wrong. We're generating <laughs> debug files for you. Mm -hmm. it doesn't say well actually I guess Linux doesn't either. It would just you know crash. But yeah, I digress. Well, at least with um. Uh, I, I assume um, if Factorio crashes on Linux, it is going to dump some uh, log files somewhere. Yes, uh, it does keep a running log, and we also do have automated crash uploading, mm -hmm. uh, crash oh, reporting. Okay. We have okay. an internal tool for that, mm -hmm. which some people are not going to be happy about, but it's really nice <laughs> because we can see exactly when we did something stupid. For example, 
a couple months ago, I made a simple bug fix in our uh, current version, and then we released a patch, and turns out I broke something pretty major. So we suddenly got a flood of like a thousand crash reports within an hour of, or it wasn't that big, but it was pretty big of like, oh yeah, we, we broke something. We got to fix this. And it gives us the stack trace. Obviously all of the personal information is redacted mm -hmm. uh, before it's uploaded, but it's, it's a really nice tool. And uh, I don't remember what the question was. Uh, I was talking about uh, logs. Yes, it does keep the logs and uploads them. And uh, so we do get pretty good information. We also have some sort of custom stack trace generator. I don't know how it works, but it gives us the exact stack trace whenever a crash happens, mm -hmm. regardless of how it happened. So it's pretty nice. Okay. Yeah. So I guess you have a pretty good understanding of, well, maybe not a good understanding, but a, a good set of information about how to find the bug. If you had a good understanding yeah. of the bug, the bug probably wouldn't have been there in the first place. Right, yeah. Uh, usually with a bug report, if they upload their log file or if we get it to the automated system and they give us the save file and the reproduction steps, we can usually reproduce it and fix it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> I, I I guess the, the thing, uh, one thing I did want to ask you about is um, so how much experience did you have with C++ when you actually went in there? And that, like what what was that experience learning it basically on the job like? Yeah, so I did have some experience via my source access before. I had made some small contributions, but even to this day, I'm not, I've never built my own project in C. I've only worked on Factorio. Mm -hmm. So the other day, I was actually on my Twitch stream. I was trying, to, I was starting to build a uh, clone of the game Osu. Uh, ah. The rhythm game. Yeah, yeah I want to yeah. make a small clone of that to like learn 2D graphics and do all sorts other things. And I had the task of I have to read the beatmap file, which is in a zip file. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to do that in C++. So lots of Stack Overflow and lots of CPP reference was used because I just had no idea how to do that. Mm -hmm. Simple things, just file I/O. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Uh, it's things like that. I've been very spoiled by working on Factorio because it's such a well-maintained code base and there's mm -hmm. a lot of really good conveniences in it mm -hmm. that uh my experience with c plus plus if i had to jump to another code base i'd take me a little bit to get up to speed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well, I, I how are you feeling now right like are you more you confident cool. working with c plus plus or at least in i'm this confident with the basics okay. but i'm not the thing i'm weakest at is the build system c plus mm plus -hmm. Well, the lack of a build system is the better word for it. I am mm -hmm. still don't really know how most of that works mm -hmm. because I haven't had to deal with it very much. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely my weakest point. Okay, okay. So with the uh, with the Wayland support, like when okay, you, you mentioned the whole fractional scaling thing. I, I guess we probably talk about that one. So what actually was the issue with uh, with scaling? Yeah, uh, on when you run something on X Wayland, at least on Sway, I don't know if this is true on KDE or GNOME. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have fractional scaling enabled and you run something in X Wayland, it doesn't actually scale. It all it does is it blows up the window, so it's at the lower resolution as if it was 1.0 scale, mm -hmm. and it looks terrible. So the reason, the main reason I wanted to support Wayland in Factorio was so I could play it on my laptop at the 1.25 scale mm -hmm. and not have it be blurry. Mm -hmm. And okay, I, I think that was yeah. That was one of the things you included in the um the uh in the post, blog. Yeah. Yes, the blog post. I I when I read that part, I didn't really understand what the issue was. But now that you're explaining it, that actually makes sense why that screenshot was there. Because maybe maybe I just didn't understand it when I read through it. Because you mentioned X level on one side, whale on one side, and I was very I was confused about why. There was like a difference in quality. I, I probably just misread it. <laughs> yeah, it could have been better. You can see under the screenshot uh, that says, notice how the game renders at the display's native resolution when mm. running under Wayland. That's basically the only mention I did. Uh, there were a few things in that article that could have been better. Mm -hmm. uh, another misconception that a lot of people got is that we were dropping X11 support. So I had to clarify that on Hacker News and say, no, we're not dropping X11 support. <laughs> you don't mm. have to worry. I guess. So the, the Wayland support was there when you got there already, or was that something you added? No, I added that. Okay. Uh, SDL supports Wayland, uh, but our build system was not set up to build it with Wayland support. So that okay. was my first task, was to 
Git SDL building with Wayland support. So why did you actually feel the need to add the Wayland support instead of, you know, because most games, because most games are just running through Proton, they're still using X Wayland, even if they're running under Wayland. Why yeah. did you feel the need to actually make it natively run on Wayland? Because of the screen scaling, mostly. Okay. okay. Uh, that's the primary reason is the screen scaling, because it just looks so bad on my laptop. Because I have a framework laptop and it has a high DPI screen, ah. and uh, it's it can at one point it was way too small. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is the um what is the um resolution of that display? Oh um I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find out. It's pretty big. It's like almost it's like one point five times bigger than 1080p. Hold on. So like. 1440p then? Uh, it is uh, 2256 by 1504. Oh, I forgot it has a 16x10. Is it a 16 by 10 display? It's a it's a 3 by 2 Oh! So okay, that so is... It it's about. like 1440p, but it's slightly bigger than that. Uh, right, okay, okay. But it's a really tiny 13-inch laptop, so it's a pretty ah. high density there. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, that makes that makes sense in why you definitely the scaling. Um, yeah. Well, yeah... It, even well, honestly, even I would need probably need the scaling at that. I think anything thirteen inches like ten p is is already kind of rough, but anything more than that, and yeah, like if you get yourself like a four k thirteen inch laptop, like <laughs> like you're just gonna run it at four x scale. Yeah, maybe not. Oh no, it's two x because it's two times each dimension, and then it's four times total. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I always forget that too, but I I make a point. But uh, yeah, it's uh not usable at one So I really wanted to be able to play Factorio on my laptop. Mm -hmm. And considering how much like little like elements there are on the screen, I guess like having that blurriness would just make it really unpleasant. It wasn't unusable, and the game was perfectly playable that way. I'm just very particular, and I want things to look pretty. Sure, yeah. If if you want the game, you just want the game to look how the game should look instead of looking like you're looking through like a a blurry, a a, a dirty shower screen or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. And aside from that, it's also just because you know Wayland, whether or not people like it, Wayland is the future. Mm -hmm. So. If we want to continue our ongoing Linux support, we need to support Wayland because mm -hmm. that's just the way Linux is going these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it it's going in that direction. <laughs> How going. long it's gonna take? Maybe maybe we're the tortoise instead of the hare, but it's going. Yeah. Well, I will often hear people say things like, "Oh, how is Wayland not ready? It's been getting developed for fifteen years, but X eleven started in nineteen. 84? I want to say 84. Um, you were correct. Yes. No, now I remember what... Yeah, I I keep saying every time... <laughs> every time I think of the um the year it started, literally 1984. I, I just... Yeah, X started in 1984. X11 was 1987. I just Googled it. Ah, <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So... It, oh, you, it, you got it. It's taken a bit of time to get here. Like, one of the things that people take for granted nowadays with X11 is the ability to hot plug monitors because that wasn't a thing when like b before i think xorg is sometime in in the xorg life i believe or maybe it was late x3d6 but in the 90s you couldn't hot plug monitors on x11 you had hmm. to plug the display in change your config reload xorg and then your display is going to work that's incredible. And that's if you don't light your display on fire by including some weird settings that would break your CRT. Right, yeah, because back in the good old days, when everything was a lot more manual. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, whole source code editing with Minecraft. Um, you don't want to have that level of control over an electronic. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, faster frame rate hack. Here you go. Run this script that you downloaded. Wait, there wasn't an internet yet, but... Uh... Run this script that I gave you on this on this floppy disk, and and then it just catches fire. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, uh, nowadays, um, you can't. Most of the there's like weird, very weird edge cases on badly made displays where you can damage things, but most things 
it's just gonna black screen for a bit and then be like, hey, you're stupid. Don't change don't don't do that setting. Yeah, there's actually one time uh on the laptop I had before this one, which was an old Dell one I got from my last job. Uh there was a kernel bug mm -hmm. that was introduced that made the display after I woke up from suspend on my laptop, the display would flash black white and then black, and then it would like flicker and do all sorts of crazy things. Mm -hmm. Turns out that it was the bug was such that if you let that go on for long enough, it would kill the screen. Oh, there was something like display synchronization, low level, really low level stuff was going horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was putting a lot of stress on the display hardware. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I had to roll back to a previous kernel to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't ask before, but with your system, do you have an AMD or an NVIDIA GPU? Uh, right now, I am running an AMD GPU. Okay. And I will forever because NVIDIA on Linux, just no. Uh, when I first switched to Linux, I had an RTX 2060 Ti. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I tried for a year, like a straight year, I was on X11. Mm -hmm. I tried everything under the sun, could not remove screen tearing. It just, I could not make it work. And back then, NVIDIA and Wayland just didn't work at all. So I said, I'm going to buy an AMD GPU because I don't want to deal with screen tearing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want to go on to Wayland. And I just can't do that with this card. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was uh, AMD from then on. Yeah, with the, the screen tearing thing, there was a... I don't know if it worked well, but I think there was a way to make it happen with NVIDIA. Um, AMD, there is explicitly a setting in X11. Uh, it's something like... Like Force Composition Pipeline, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, something like, like that. that. Um, it works, at least from my experience, it was working quite well uh, with the AMD GPU on X11. Um, have you guys had any, uh, like, NVIDIA-specific bug reports with, uh, with Linux then? Um, not that I know. Oh, actually, there were some that I can remember. Uh, I don't have the details in front of me, okay. but there were some people who were saying, hey, the game won't even start, and it was NVIDIA and Wayland, and I said, oh, you're just out of luck right now. Sorry, it's not <laughs> our fault. Uh, ironically enough, we actually get more problems on AMD cards because apparently AMD's OpenGL drivers are just complete garbage. Uh, so... We get a lot of weird one-off errors that we just can't fix because mm -hmm. the AMD's OpenGL drivers are questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, the solution to that is to switch to Vulkan, but that's a whole thing in itself. Yeah, I, like, I, I, I don't really have an experience doing graphics development at that level. I've done some like basic game development stuff in Unity, but that's that's pretty much it. So, if you guys wanted to add Vulkan support, like, what would what would that actually entail? I know like graphics isn't like your your main thing, but um, if there's anything you can explain there, that'll be that'll be awesome. Yeah, so we have an abstraction over graphics backends because we support DirectX and OpenGL. Mm -hmm. So we have a, we have an interface that abstracts over both of them, and then we have implementations for each. Mm -hmm. So we would just have to write the implementation <laughs> for Vulkan. But as you might have heard online, Vulkan is significantly more difficult to work with than any other graphics library, and that's because it was significantly lower level. So it would be a lot of dedicated developer time, and then we have the ongoing cost of fixing bugs and stuff. Uh, we just haven't, we just uh, haven't uh, done that yet at this mm -hmm. point. So it's just a matter of, uh, well, it's not just a matter of adding it. It's also a matter of then making sure that as you add additional things the three different backends also... I assume there's a different backend on the macOS side? No, actually, macOS uses OpenGL. Okay, okay. Even though it's going to become a problem because macOS doesn't support it anymore. Well, they haven't and properly supported it for a long time, but they, they still have it. That's <laughs> They still have it, but they don't update it anymore, right. as, as far as I know. Uh, so we're stuck on an old OpenGL version. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, what I was, was going to say there is... It's not just a matter of adding it and making sure it works well. It's making sure that all of them work consistently. You don't have weird graphical bugs as you add new things in. Right. And like, even though we have our good Linux support, the vast majority of our players are on Windows and they're going to be using DirectX. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of our development resources have gone into the DirectX backend. So the OpenGL backend is actually quite a bit slower than the DirectX one. Mm -hmm. So the graphics don't perform as well on Linux as they do on Windows. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fortunate thing is that Factorio can run on a potato, so it doesn't really make much of a practical difference. Yeah, that is a nice thing about having a 
a fairly light art style. It's obvious. You like, say that, but you'd be surprised how much work goes into it. What no, what I mean is like, it's you're not trying to do like hyper realism or anything. Like, it's it's got a style that works. The problem is you just have lots of things going on. <laughs> Right. Actually, just the the blog post we put out last week mm. is the first time we've used dynamic lighting in the entire game. Because up until now, uh, everything has been baked into the sprites, mm. basically. I mean, there's been like, you have lamps and it just makes the sprites brighter or changes their lookup tables. Mm. I don't know the exact details. But now we're actually using normal maps and all of the 3D lighting effects that you would see in a 3D game for our asteroids. That's so that's, really that was a big cool. jump for us. That actually does sound really, really cool. Yeah, it's incredible. It's awesome. I I had a blast reading that because I'm not very well versed in graphics programming. Mm -hmm. It's something that I've been wanting to get into, and I've actually started going through the Learn OpenGL mm -hmm. uh, book to make my first 3D game. But uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's very difficult. Learn OpenGL. I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's LearnOpenGL.com. Oh, it's, so I really website. recommend. Okay, okay. Ah, uh, okay. I okay. I was just gonna. I clicked on the book and then I realized. Wait, my Amazon's logged in. Let's not show that. Um, <laughs> oh, are you showing? Are you gonna show? Your no, screen? yeah, I, I was gonna show the actual Amazon listing and then I I uh, stepped back away from that. <laughs> like, oh, well, there's five items in your car. What could what could be there? Well, it's less that. It's more about my uh my location because it will oh, show like okay, where it's gotcha. shipped to. It's not like the exact address, but it will have like the suburb. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I have I've not been a very good job of protecting my online presence. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, I released a project that had the exact coordinates of my house in it. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm kind of screwed. <laughs> I've moved since then, but you could easily trace where I live. It's not that hard. Yeah, the only time I've had something bad like that happen is it wasn't my fault, but. There was a, um, what do you call it? Like a domain seller. Um, what are they? Oh. Where they had a data leak. And yeah, my, luckily it was just addresses and nothing more than that. But yeah, there were people who were like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we sent pizzas to Brody's house? Like, no, we be normal. Like, what are you doing? That's... I don't. I don't understand. That's that's per social relationship at its finest. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but hey, uh, I moved since then as well, so it's good. Not a problem anymore. The the <laughs> one thing that was a real, <laughs> a real dumb problem. Um, I, I so I have a dot files repo, uh, repo as well, and I accidentally committed my um stream key at one point. Oops. <laughs> Luckily, the person who... So there was someone who saw it and started streaming on my channel. But what they streamed is a big black screen that was like, Hey, Brody, your stream key is public. <laughs> so I was like, ah, thank you for that. I'll fix Oopsie. that. <laughs> That's hilarious. At least it was a, at least it was a uh, good Samaritan. Yeah, yeah. Since then, I... And if they I've... were really a good Samaritan, they would have just emailed you, but... You would think that, but hey, they wanted to have a bit of fun with it anyway. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, my... Hold on, I'm looking... I actually think because of the way WL Sunset works, which is my screen dimmer, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't found a way to make it use my current location. So my approximate coordinates are actually in my dot files right now. <laughs> yep, I... right there. Jesus Christ. Yeah, maybe. Uh... Well, I need to see how accurate this is. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna react to it. <laughs> but hopefully, it's your capital. Oh, thanks, Google, for removing the minus. <laughs> oh, Google Maps can't even find it. Okay, that's neat. Sure. Okay, okay. Well, well, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's based on your time zone, it would be based on, like, your capital, I would assume. Yeah, probably. Um, I just haven't found a way to make that work. There's some things, like, there were... Uh... What was it called? There was some um, like geolocation interface that should work, but I could never get it to run, and mm -hmm. I just gave up at some point. And just hard coded it. I used to heavily use a uh, a screen dimmer like back when I was on Windows, but I don't know. I just when I swapped to Linux, I just never bothered to set something up. 
and there are obviously there are things that do work on Wayland depending on the specific like back end you're using. I just I just just didn't really care to use it for whatever reason. Hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm a bit distracted. I'm, I'm by trying to figure out where this coordinates point, but I can't. Uh, whatever. That's I'll do it later. So good. So good. I think I said it to the state capital, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know how to segue from that. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Uh, we've talked about Waylands. Uh, oh, there's some other things we could talk about there. Uh, there's something that I wanted to talk about in the blog post mm -hmm. that I didn't have room or time for. Uh, there's been some interesting bugs due to the way Wayland is implemented. So Wayland, when a screen or sorry, when a window is obscured, mm -hmm. it lowers the, the rate at which it can submit frames. So when your Factorio is full screen on your monitor, uh, it's 60 frames a second, no problem. But as soon as you switch to another Sway workspace, it throttles it to 20 frames a second. And that's only <laughs> because SDL implemented a workaround to make that work. Uh, hmm. Otherwise, it would throttle it like I don't know how low it goes, like one a second, but it just it, it's for power consumption reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously, in our game, our game is single. Th well, it's not single threaded, but the main update loop has to wait for the runner to finish before it can keep processing the rest of the game. So that's caused problems. If you're on a multiplayer server and you switch away from the game, you'll get dropped mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you start falling behind. It's really annoying. Fortunately, there is a fix in the works for that, but it's taking several years, and yeah, it's been it's been quite a journey to wait for that fix. I didn't realize that happened. Uh, is that wait? Yeah, yeah it's I, uh. I because I, the, I the, let me just think of what I'm trying to say. Um. Because when I, I have OBS open, I guess I would have always had it on a secondary screen, but it would still be visible. Huh. I know that KDE does that. I didn't know Sway did that as well. Yeah, it's a fundamental Wayland thing. Is it? Any Wayland compositor will throttle windows that you can't see. I don't, I don't know how some get around it. I, yeah, think I they don't use remember Hyperlink like... doing that, but maybe I'm misremembering. I think OBS has a separate render thread, so I think that doesn't affect them. Well, but... I also would have someone have like a game that I tab out of and I move to a different um, workspace. I don't remember Hyperland doing that, but maybe I, I I could be misremembering. I'll have to test Hyperland. Maybe they worked around it. But hmm. like I said, there are some works or fixes in the works. Uh, the SDL is going to get an event that will let us and that'll notify us when the window is no longer visible. So I can just stop rendering altogether, mm -hmm. uh, which will be a much more efficient, but that's not there yet. So right now, if you run Factorio on Wayland, just don't don't hide it because then you'll get dropped. <laughs> huh. That's really annoying. And uh, It is very annoying. Is that the only platform that has that issue? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we can. There's, there's, uh, there's a, another example we can go to and in, into as well. Uh, something that only happens on Wayland. Wayland has a fixed input buffer for every client, mm -hmm. and when the buffer overflows, the client gets killed. So when Factorio is frozen and you move your mouse too much, the game closes. <laughs> and Factorio freezes quite a bit, especially if. You place a gigantic blueprint, the game freezes while it processes that mm -hmm. because it's a single threaded mostly game. Uh, and so I, if I'm running it on Wayland, I just have to not touch my mouse because otherwise the game will just turn off. That's really annoying. Yeah. Is there some and way it that only can happens work around? on Wayland? Sorry, what? I was going to say, is, that, is there some way that can be worked around or is that just like a fundamental issue? Uh, it was a fundamental issue. Just like a month ago, they finally merged a change that will make the input buffer resize automatically on mm -hmm. the server side. Uh, I don't know if that'll fix it automatically for us because I haven't tested it yet, but I'm hoping that it will. <laughs> yeah, these are the these are the kinds of things. Uh, like I said, you have to keep ongoing platform support, especially with Wayland, because. Uh, there's a lot of issues that came up after I added the support that I never would have expected. <clears throat> well, I guess that is the one nice thing about supporting X11, because X11 is basically dead. At least that part of it doesn't really change. Yes, it's very stable. 
Yeah, sta- Debian's Double also chain. stable. <laughs> <laughs> Running three-year-old dependencies is quite stable. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you have a version of XORG within the last 10 years, you're fine. <laughs> oh, actually, I think you might be right. Pretty much all that's happened is, I, like, some bug fixes. I'm sure there's been at least a couple of minor, or maybe there's, maybe, actually, I guess variable refresh rate's probably been added in the last 10 years. That's probably the only oh, major really? feature I can think of. I didn't even know XORG supported that. That's cool. It does. It's jank. It doesn't work properly. Oh, it, um... <laughs> I think it only works properly on a single monitor. I mean, I can't use it either because right now on Sway, even though it supports VRR theoretically, <laughs> if you move your mouse, it hops right back up to the max refresh rate. And it's been an open bug report for years and they just haven't fixed it because it's not a high priority. Huh. And I don't blame them. Like The thing to remember, especially with all the people who say, oh, Wayland's taken 10 plus years to come <laughs> out. People are doing this, a lot of people are doing this on their own free time. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So you can only expect so much. Yeah. That being said, when there are people who are actively doing things that make things worse, um, there are issues there. Uh, yes. Obviously, the thing I... The, the first thing I want to bring up is the one that you've talked about is the client-side and server-side decoration thing. My issue with that is they agree... Uh, did they agree to the spec? I... Th- I'm right thinking of DRM leasing. They definitely didn't oppose the spec initially. Um, and there were patch sets to get server-side decorations implemented in GNOME. And it's just... Okay, for any... I, I've explained this a million times before. For anyone who hasn't heard my rant before. So, client-side decorations are when the application window is responsible for drawing the decorations of the window so that being things like the header bar where it has your close icon full screen things like that you might have the title of the window you might have an icon for the window depending on the uh the desktop you're doing client side decorations means that the application every single application that wants to have those things there has to draw them itself whereas server side decorations mean that the desktop is responsible for adding them. There are benefits to having server-side decorations because it allows you to integrate things into the header bar. If you look at a lot of GNOME applications, for example, they have their um, their hamburger menu in the actual header bar. If you look at something like Steam, it has a custom header bar where it integrates nicely into the rest of the application. Spotify, they have a lot of their um, account settings in their header bar. It works... It's nice, and if developers want to have it, it's really nice to have as an option. But there are some cases where it just doesn't make sense to have to add them yourself. Good example is games. But another good example is, let's say you are doing a um, a, a Python scientific nonsense, whatever, and you want to show some sort of graph, and that graph appears in a window... You are responsible for making sure the header bar of that window is drawn. You're just trying to show a graph on the screen. Like, that, that is not at all relevant to what you're doing. Exactly. And in our case, uh, when we initially came out with the Wayland support, the, one of the first bug reports that came in and said, Hey, I'm on Wayland. I'm using GNOME. Uh, the game is not, doesn't have a title bar. Mm-hmm. Please fix. And I was like, okay, well, maybe this is... Just some weird thing, or maybe we just need to update SDL, I don't know. But uh, then I looked into it, and yeah, GNOME does not render cl- server-side decorations. If your client does not provide decorations, there are none. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I got fairly annoyed by this, because I'm like, hey, we're a video game. On other platforms, regardless of the implementation details, I'm looking at you, Reddit. Um, mm-hmm. On other platforms, we don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just submit our game's frame buffer, and the... The, win- the Windows libraries or the Cocoa libraries, they do everything for us. They have the title bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gnome on Wayland is the only desktop environment and the only place in the world where we have to worry about this problem. And it was quite annoying because of that. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, the fix wasn't that difficult. We just had to bring in another dependency. Uh, but the dependency also doesn't work correctly because it doesn't follow the uh, GTK4 theme. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, it's been an adventure. I will say, though, before uh, I hand it back to Brody, is uh, 
I was very displeased with the amount of toxicity I saw on this on Reddit, especially after I uh, posted this and it got spread around the news or spread around the internet. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people who were borderline personally attacking the GNOME devs and that's never okay. I have problems with GNOME. I don't have problems with the people. Mm -hmm. Everyone is a person. They're doing what they think is best. So please don't attack them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if people take that, like, if they take it way too far, right? You know, it's, yeah. I like to be very critical of what the GNOME devs are doing, right? I, I think that the way they're handling this is actively detrimental to not just their desktop, but, uh, like, application developers who are trying to support Wayland. But that does not mean you should go out of your way and, like, send them DMs and, like, you know, rant about, like, just... Just be a normal person. Like, how difficult is it to just be a normal person on social media? And it's fine to be critical of it and bring this up as an issue. And that's, that's like, fine. But as the second you're going to be doing personal attacks, you've crossed a line. Just stop doing that. Yeah. And uh, I might have... I don't know. The, the tone that I took in the blog post was fairly harsh mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> excuse me i even said in their infinite wisdom as you pointed out uh <laughs> i might have gotten that from you actually i'm not sure though <laughs> but yeah it's never okay to victim or not victimize it's never okay to take things too far yeah. so please be nice um that being said i do wish that gnome would see the lights and even though it's not technically required by the whatever protocol or or specification is please do server side decorations gnome because you are the most popular desktop environment and every barrier there is to native linux support for games especially is another barrier to people not making native linux applications mm -hmm. we have to come together and try to make things as simple as possible and that's not to say we should copy every bad design decision from windows but we have to make it as seamless as possible mm -hmm. and this is just even though in this specific circumstance, it's not that big of a deal to fix. It's just one more thing. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is with LibDecor not using the um, GTK theme correctly. That seems like an issue on their side. Yeah. The thing with LibDecor is like, even though it's just one dependency, it also has its own dependencies. And uh, with SDL, we don't have to link against LibDecor because SDL links it at a runtime. Mm -hmm. uh, but for simpler applications, if you want to just draw a graph, and uh, you just want to submit your OpenGL frame buffer with your graph. But then instead, you have to bring in LibDecor and, Lib and Pango Cairo and all these other things to draw the title bar. And it's just, it adds a lot of complexity. It shifts the burden of that complexity from the desktop environment to the clients. Yeah. Where it gets also really weird, like you're using, I assume that Factorio uses a relatively modern version of SDL. Yes, uh, our 1.1 version is a few versions outdated now, but mm -hmm. our master branch, our 2.0 version, is on the latest version. Mm -hmm. So I know someone who is developing a game in a older LTS of Unity, and that version doesn't yet have proper Wayland support developed. I think the modern version, yeah, the, the newest version of Unity, I think they have experimental Wayland support. But on this older version... If he wants to have window decorations, he's going to have to develop that outside of the engine, which is not a pleasant experience to do with Unity. Like, it really does not want you to break out of that environment. Right. And that is a... Uh, the bur Shifting the burden of maintenance on the clients is not just isolated to this incident. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another problem. Well, the, the problem with the input buffer overflowing that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier... The initial response I saw from Wayland developers is, why isn't your input on a separate thread? That's the client's fault. Mm -hmm. And that is just, it makes, it doesn't make me angry. It just makes me frustrated because if you want Wayland to be widely used, you have to be flexible enough to allow all of the non-conforming clients to work and to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you don't want to be like, oh, we need to support X11 natively. I mean, X Wayland is amazing, but and I'm grateful that they did that. But things like, oh, why isn't your input on a separate thread? We can't do that because SDL doesn't support that. We would have to switch to a different low-level library, and that would be a year-plus worth of work. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's just not feasible. And that attitude 
while I'm, I get that they're trying to avoid the pitfalls of X11, where X11 got so bad because they were doing what was beneficial for them at the time and they didn't really think about the future very much. Mm -hmm. That's how we got there to where we are today. Wayland's taking that opposite approach, but they sometimes take it too far by assuming that clients are going to be well behaved. And uh, it took a long time for them to finally come around to uh, resizing that input buffer because they're like, oh, why aren't the clients behaving? Yeah, a common thread I see is well, just write the application better. Like, why yeah. are you doing that? Well, what is the purpose of like this functionality? And that I, I get that question being asked, but when people are developing applications for Windows and Mac OS where, or X11, where certain things are just there and are expected to work, you can't just then say, why did you ever do that? Because you are the... Like, Wayland is not just the small platform. It, it's not just Linux being the small platform. It's the small platform on the small platform that is trying to dictate how the entire world of software gets developed. Like, a good example of this is the XDG top-level icon discussion. So, <laughs> this is a nightmare discussion. For anyone who hasn't heard about this one, the idea, it's, it's such a basic thing. You want to have a parent window that has an icon, and then the child the, the the child windows having different icons than the parent. So if it's something like a one of the examples used is um Libre PCB, where you have your main section and then like different section I don't know PCB terminology, but different sections that are focused on different parts of the PCB have their own specific icons. And that's something that is just not possible under Wayland. And for a couple of months, there was... Actually, maybe it was like the first month. There was a lot of discussions about, well, do we even want the ability to, for Windows to be able to set different icons? Why would you use this? What is the functionality of it? Are people going to abuse this feature? Are they going to use this to pretend like they are Windows for other applications? And all of these are fair questions, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a method of design that has been used for a long time. And even if Wayland says this is bad and no one should ever use it, that's not going to stop anything because Windows still supports it. Mac OS still supports it. X11 still supports it. And you can't control what the rest of the world is doing when you are the, the, minor the minority of the minority solution. You're not like, you're not internet explorer or google chrome at its absolute heights where you can control what the web is going to be doing you are less than one percent of the development ecosystem right i mean you have like the top one percent we're the bottom one percent mm -hmm. we we have no say in how the wider ecosystem works and like like i said i understand where they're coming from but if you want wayland to be usable at a wide scale it has to be more flexible yeah yeah I don't know what's going to happen with Wayland because things are getting very rough, especially in that that top level icon discussion repo. Because um, there's been some like, it's not just because of that repo; it's because of multiple years of discussions where people are just like people are getting burnt out, right? Like they've there's so many issues that are getting stalled. There's so many times that issues are getting rehashed and. Like, I get it, right? You know, you've, you work five months on a protocol and then, like, right near the end, it's, hey, let's have a discussion about the things we already talked about for five months already. Let's rehash them again, even though the result is going to be exactly the same. And this goes back to what we were saying, right? The people who are working on this are people. And a lot of them are doing it in their free time. And when it seems like the work you've been doing for all of these months is about to just go up in flames because like a few people have issues that they don't want to let go of like it, it it's like i i look i for one wouldn't be able to keep my cool working in this repo i i'm very glad that the people who have voting rights in wayland are like rational people who like can step away when they need to step away. 
yeah instead of letting it pile up until they just hate their own lives and just don't let anything happen yeah yeah so i guess okay with the whole the Wayland Sport and Factorio, we've talked about the bad things, but besides the whole fractional scaling thing and making that work, like what else has been has been a positive with not just supporting uh, Linux but supporting Wayland? I'd say, uh, hmm, I don't know. The fractional scaling is pretty good, mm -hmm. but some people have said that the game feels smoother, mm -hmm. and but I actually. I don't really know because I use Wayland has inherent vsync inside of it. And that's, there's like tearing protocols that are now starting to go through finally that lets you get screen tearing back when you really need it. Mm -hmm. uh, but theoretically, it uses fewer resources, but it's mostly just uh, the same experience. Mm -hmm. If you're on a 1.0 display scale thing, uh, X Wayland is so good that you're not going to notice half the time. Mm -hmm. Like all Proton games right now run through X11 mm -hmm. and you have a great experience. Uh, so I'd say the upsides, the reason why I focus so much on the negative is because the, the positives are a lot harder to see. Uh, like, you know, intellectually that it's running through Wayland and there's like, oh, you have the new stack. And like, that makes me happy. But for the end user experience on, on Factorio 1.1, especially, it's actually a detriment to your experience in a lot of ways mm -hmm. because of the... Uh, input overflow issue and the throttling when it's not out issue. Mm. So I guess that's why I focus so much on the negative because the positives, when it's working, it's great, mm. but there's still some glaring issues. So it's hard to keep that in mind. Yeah, the the positives, then then maybe not positives that are inherent to the Wayland platform. Maybe they're positives over X11, but in a lot of cases... The things that are working well are a lot less visible, right? Like if yes. you're if things are good and it's working like it should be, like if you know that it otherwise wouldn't be working maybe a couple of months ago, then yeah, you can definitely be like, oh, hey look, it's working now, thanks to uh, Terran Protocol, for example. Um But other things where it just behaves like it would on other platforms, I guess that's the it's not a, a like exciting selling point but like the best selling point is it just works the way that it should be working it just works mm -hmm. yeah uh that pretty much sums it up yeah it's <laughs> I, I had a point and then i forgot it so mm -hmm. now i'm stalling <laughs> so um with the whole tearing support thing like what is what is your personal thoughts on having tearing there because the discussion there was really weird where initially developers were like why would you want tearing like the whole point of this is perfect frames like you don't nobody wants tearing like what's the point of that but i i had been a supporter of the protocol from the start and i'm very glad that it actually got merged and i think the the coolest thing about that discussion is Simon Sir was the first one who commented on that, being like, I don't understand why anybody would ever want this. But he was also the first person who ended up getting it implemented. Yeah, I've had a pretty good experience overall with the Source Hut guys. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I use Sway. That's that's Sir Compton's Wayland compositor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had used, actually used Source Hut for a while, and I liked my experience with there. Uh, but... I like the tearing protocol because most of the time you're right. Like most people aren't going to notice a couple milliseconds, but mm -hmm. I play Osu. Uh, I'm not like super high in the ranks or anything, but I play it high enough at a high enough level to be able to tell mm -hmm. when the V-Sync is causing lag. Mm -hmm. So I've been really looking forward to the tearing protocol because it will get rid of that much more latency from where my cursor actually is to where I see it. Mm -hmm. And especially when you get higher into that game, it can make an extreme amount of difference, mm -hmm. especially when you have like a 60 hertz monitor. Mm. Oh, yes. 16 milliseconds is a long time. Especially if it's a 60 hertz monitor, for sure. Yeah, like I have a 144 hertz ultra wide that I'm using here, but I play Osu on my laptop sometimes and I have to switch to i3 for that because the 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 latency on Sway is just too high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess with like the regular desktop stuff, right? I think that's the, I, I think this is a big a big problem with a lot of the um the Wayland discussion. It's a problem, and I, I I get how it happens, right? 
the people who are developing Wayland, a lot of them are not, like, the regular Linux users. And that, that makes sense, because they're spending all of their time writing C++ code and writing XML files. Like, it makes sense that no. you are a very, very, I guess, uh, how would you say it? Like, deep into the Linux ecosystem. This is why a lot of, like, Fedora, for example, they swapped to uh, default Wayland back in... God, uh, like, 2017, I want to say? Maybe even earlier? How long ago? Yeah, on the GNOME side, on um, AMD GPUs, huh. yeah, they swapped a long, long time back. And back then, you couldn't screen capture. Like, there was no screen capture support at all. There was a lot of other things that were broken, and just... It was not usable for a regular user, let alone the NVIDIA stuff, where NVIDIA back then... I don't think you could do GPU acceleration on x Wayland. Like, gaming was impossible... Um, well, I mean, that only recently landed, GPU yeah. acceleration in this way land. I don't remember how long ago it was, but it's definitely relatively recent. Uh, maybe in the past couple of years? I thought it was the past couple of months, but I could be wrong. No, no, definitely definitely longer than oh, that. Oh, no, I'm thinking... Of, okay, no, I'm wrong. You're right. Explicit Go sync ahead. is the past uh, couple of months. Yeah, that's probably what I'm thinking of, but I thought it was also the hardware acceleration in general in x Uh, Yeah, no, no, it's definitely... It, you might be thinking of something else, Um. But it okay. definitely wasn't there back in 2017. Um, yeah, that, I mean, obviously, I use so. AMD, so I don't actually know what the problems are. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I do as well. It just works but... for me. Yeah, yeah. I do as well, but I still like to keep an eye on uh, what's going on. But right. the when that was swap was made, it was not ready. Like, there was, it was not ready at all. But if you're a developer and your entire d uh, day consists of opening up Element to look at Matrix, opening up a browser and opening up a text editor... Wayland worked perfectly. It was no mm -hmm. issue at all. But yeah, I mean, for the users, like it was a little rougher back then. Yeah, and I mean Linux. I mean, hopefully, especially with the Windows Copilot garbage that happened recently, <laughs> uh, we're probably going to see an influx of Linux users. Mm -hmm. And so the requirements that people have for Wayland to be usable for them is going to go up. Like for me, I the lack of global hotkeys is still really annoying for me because I only have one monitor. Mm -hmm. So whenever I want to stream, I have to have OBS on my screen in order to switch scenes and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just not a good experience. There are workarounds for that. Like the way that I do it on KDE is there's a thing called the legacy X11 app support, which just lets you pass in your keys directly to X Wayland applications. And I run OBS through X Wayland and it gotcha. just, yeah, it just does the thing. Um, I suppose if it's using Pipewire, it would work just fine, so. What do you mean? For screen sharing, I mean. Oh, screen sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to work. Um, but the global hotkeys. I guess a there are some, some workarounds that you can do. There is the um, OBS WebSocket CLI. Mm. So you could use that and then bind Sway hotkeys to uh, WebSocket commands. I actually did that last week as an experiment, and it works, but it feels bad. Okay, yeah. Um, the another option is there's an Android app called OBS Blade, which is also controlling it over WebSockets, but is done from an external device. Oh, that's cool. Um, I, I've been meaning to do a video on that for a long, long time, but... Yeah, the, the yeah. OBS WebSocket API is gross. <laughs> there's a lot of things where I just... The, the app... So OBS Blade, it has its section of things that works, and then it has an advanced section where it's just a list of other, like, things that you can call, and it's like, I don't know what any of this stuff does. Using this may break OBS. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i hoping uh, that the Global Shortcuts portal lands sometime within my lifetime. Well, the, uh, That'd be nice. The portal's weird, because it's there upstream, and... I think KDE has their portal implementation. Um, GNOME doesn't yet. But we also just don't have any applications that are using the portal or expecting the portal. So you're in this like weird chicken and egg situation where you don't have the desktops adding it because nothing wants to use it, but you don't have anything wanting to use it because the desktops haven't added it. Right. And like in the grand scheme of things, it's uh, compared to other things, it's not a huge priority. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to take a while. It is a big deal in the case of screen readers, unless they decide to add in some sort of ex another API for screen readers. Um, right. But yeah, that that's the main issue. When it comes to things like 
push to talk in Discord working or hotkeys in OBS. Like, it, yeah, it's annoying, but it's not a major, major deal. But right. I think the accessibility argument is a lot bigger of a selling point for most people. Yeah, I only recently found out that the accessibility situation in Wayland is garbage. Uh, I don't have to worry about that, thankfully, because I have two arms and functioning eyes and ears. But uh, uh, for people who don't, like, it's just their lives are terrible on Wayland right now. Yeah. I, the accessibility stuff is a big part of the reason why Gnome hasn't actually dropped their X11 session completely. They've made it not the default, but it's still sticking around in a big part because of that because if they drop it like you are effectively just dropping all of those people right and there's only so much you can do fundamentally because correct me if i'm wrong uh excuse me as far as i'm aware the x11 protocol has things like draw a text and draw a box mm -hmm. whereas wayland you're just submitting frame buffers like the wayland compositor doesn't really know what the content of the application is. It just knows, hey, here's some pixels, display them, please. So it's actually, it might end up being that applications have to implement accessibility features and not have it be a part of the compositor, mm. which is going to be, it's never going to happen, <clears throat> to be honest. Like, there's always going to be applications that just won't do it, yeah. especially video games and stuff. Yeah. Well, there's also the whole issue with um, uh, non Latin text, where if you want to do like, Japanese input or Korean input on Wayland, it does work, but it's very flaky between toolkits where certain... I think GNOME only supports iBus. So if you want to use anything else, then... Um, yeah, you just can't type. So it's not just accessibility in that sense. It's accessibility for people who don't want to use their system in English or can't use their system in English. Yeah, it's it's a big problem, and fortunately, there are people working on accessibility in Wayland, but as always, it's a slow process. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the accessibility stuff on Linux was funded by Sun back in the early 2000s, and it sort of just stayed in that state for a long time. It just, it's been like, you know, kind of hacked on a little bit here and there, but ever since that point, it's never had a big, dedicated development effort behind it, because... Like, accessibility is very important, but it's also a... It's important for a small group of people, right? Like, a thing that's going to affect a lot more people is getting, I don't know, screen tearing support done, or getting just, like, these basic... Like, global hotkeys, right? So it's, it's, it's super important for a small group, but it's not, in the grand scheme of the desktop, a big focus. Right, yeah, because within our minority of Linux users, the people who need accessibility features are an even smaller minority. Yeah. And no matter how uh, virtuous your intentions are, you only have so many hours and so many brain cells. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, you have to allocate resources. Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem with pretty much anything that you want to do. Like, there's always, especially because, as we said, like, most people in Linux are volunteers, and... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you have a maybe you're in a lucky position where you have a job where you can work on open source, but that's just not that many people. And even then, those people generally being paid for a specific task, they are being paid as a GNOME developer to work on graphics support. They're being paid to work on a distro. They're being paid to work on the Linux kernel. They're not being paid just to make random commits to random things. A lot of those people do make commits to other things as well, but like, it is, it, it's a difficult thing to solve because ultimately they are going to end up still doing stuff in their free time and there's only so much free time, sadly. It would be nice if we all had multiple lives we could live at the same time and do a bunch more work, but it doesn't happen. Yeah, I've felt that because I, I have so many factorial mods and I have uh, several other open source projects. For example, I'm writing a Lua language server mm -hmm. slowly. Uh, cause the one, the ones that exist right now, I'm, are just not good enough. Um, but that project is taken over. I, it's been, I've been sitting on it doing almost nothing for like eight months or nine months. I just recently started working on the type system again because, uh, I only have so many brain cells I can allocate to programming in a day. And now that I have a full-time job where I'm working on a, 
complicated C++ code base, like two plus million lines. Mm -hmm. uh, once I'm done working, the last thing I want to do is work more. Right. So my, my amount of anime watching has gone significantly up in the last year. <laughs> Well, you know what? Let's yeah. go. Let's go completely, um, completely side tangent. Then, uh, what are you actually watching? Then, uh, right now I'm watching. Well, right now I'm uh, staying current on Demon Slayer and Konosuba. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite show is Free Rin. I'm a basic guy. Uh, I like the top rated show on my anime list. It's mm -hmm. great. It's it's so good. Uh, I I'm not like super into. I'm not like a super niche weeb, but. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of the mainstream shows, although I still haven't watched Chainsaw Man or Jujutsu Kaisen. <laughs> how, how did those ones skip your right? Uh, skip your your. Uh, I don't know. Your... I watched the first season of Jujutsu Kaisen and it was fun. Okay, but... okay. I think you especially mean you hadn't watched any all of it at all. Of the, like, I'm not gonna be like one of those people who say, "Oh, you have to boycott things because of their working conditions," but. Like, I, I already wasn't that interested in Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. And then when I heard about the hellish working conditions they went through, I'm just like, no, I'm just not going to watch it. That's fair. Uh, That's fair. And then Chainsaw Man, I just, I don't know. I just never got around to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm I watching all of that and a lot more. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like your figure I, collection. I probably should. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of things back. <laughs> a couple of things back there. Um, yeah, I probably should watch less, but... <laughs> <laughs> i want to like my my next um my next programming goal is i want to i want to start learning rust i i've been like so rust is weird for me because i've known about rust and i've been talking to people about rust since the rust beta there were people who were selling me on it back then were like this is going to change the way people do development it's going to become such a big language this is when nobody was using rust um and now you know rust is like Google has adopted it for Android development, like in like in their kernel level stuff. Um, there is a bunch of other companies that are adopting it now. We have Cosmic coming out, which is a full Rust based desktop, which is just not Incredible. something that was possible that long ago on on Linux. Because System seventy six is a big part of the reason why there's even developed Rust GUI tooling. Like it existed before, but if you look at Iced, they are like a lot of the System76 guys are now like top contributors on that project. Like they have brought that ecosystem so far forward. So you were a rushed shell before it was cool. I wasn't a rushed shell. I was just aware of it. You know, I was like you. <laughs> uh, I I knew about Linux way back when, and I just hadn't had never messed around with it. Right. Yeah. I actually used Rust for a year mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of my side projects. Well, mm -hmm. two of them. Uh, but I ended up dropping it in the end because uh, the limitations were bothering me and my development productivity was too low. Mm. And people will tell me that that's a skill issue and they're right. I just, I don't like Rust very much. Mm -hmm. But well, everyone is different. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, going back to C++, what, like, how, do, how do you feel about C++? Like, not just your experience with it, because we touched on that before, but like, how do you actually feel about the language itself? I feel like if you stick to the same subset of it that like actually makes sense like oh hey you can have classes oh hey you can overload some methods uh it's actually a really nice language to work with like mm -hmm. i can express what i want to do in a concise way a lot of the time mm -hmm. and uh there are some things like the error messages are horrible like it took me a long time to figure out that there's a specific one i'm thinking of where uh the error message is something like cannot uh uh, there's no like there's no constructor there's no implicit copy constructor for this thing but the actual solution is to just dereference it uh okay or no it's the, the actual solution is to put const in front of it because that's a const copy constructor but not a non-const copy constructor uh it's just things like that uh but if you stick to the same subset of the language i feel like it's not that bad until you have to actually build your program and then it's just terrible all around mm -hmm. So but yeah, I am. I've gotten a lot better at it over the last year. Mm -hmm. So, what is your your background with programming actually like? Because obviously you did the Factorio modding, but did you have experience doing any coding before that, or what, what was it like? Actually, the majority of my experience is in Lua. Okay. Before I got into Linux, I made uh, rain meter skins uh, for Windows. Uh, rain meter is like a desktop customization thing where you can get skins. <laughs> and uh, you can put them on your desktop. Mm -hmm. I made a suite for that called Modern Gadgets. You can actually still find it on my GitHub, but it's archived now. 
uh, it was fairly popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, the skin, the skins themselves are INI files, but you also can use Lua scripts to do fancier things. So that was my initial foray into real programming, mm -hmm. my experience up to then being Scratch. Uh, so I went from Scratch to Lua for Rainmere skins. Then I graduated to Lua for factorial modding, and now I and then I did Rust, and now I'm doing Rust and Go, and a little bit of Python, although I don't really like Python, mm -hmm. and but mainly C++ now. So you're f you you learned to program in Scratch then? Yes. Okay. Uh, when when was that? Uh, that was around 2009. So uh, that was back when Scratch was still a thing you had to install on your computer. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to download the Scratch editor to be able to make Scratch programs. <laughs> uh, that's where I learned things like if statements and, uh, re well, it was called forever if, but uh, for loops and things like that. Uh, and then my mind exploded when Scratch 3.0 came out and you could define custom blocks that do things, which is just functions. Mm -hmm. uh, that was amazing. Uh, but that's what got me into programming. And I actually made some pretty stuff I'm pretty proud of on Scratch. Uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's I recommend Scratch. If you want to have kids that are interested in computers, give, give them Scratch. Like, expose them to it because mm -hmm. it is a really great learning resource for programming for kids especially. I was completely unaware of things like Scratch when I first started programming. It was definitely out because I would have been, what, like 12? Something like that, 12. 11 or 12. Um, but I, my, my first experience with programming was a, um, a thing called Greenfoot. So I'd say it is a Java uh, yeah. game library toolkit sort of thing. Um, I was lucky enough to have in my high school a programming class. And we were using this to do our game development. Um, now the, the funny thing about it is the teacher who was running the class, he was not a very experienced programmer. He just wanted to run the class, but he was reading the textbook, basically a chapter ahead of us for each class. So wow. whatever, so I, I came across like this thing called an enum and I was like, Hey, how do enums work? And he was like, I don't know what that is. That's hilarious. Yeah. I... I didn't have, well, actually, I did have one programming class in high school. I forgot about that, actually, mm -hmm. uh, where we used Java. Mm -hmm. And I was the top of that class uh, because I'd already been doing Scratch for so long. Like, where, whereas my, my classmates were struggling with if statements, I was like, oh, I, these are easy because uh, mm -hmm. Scratch had already taught me how they work. Mm -hmm. That's why I really recommend Scratch because you don't have to worry about syntax. You just drag and drop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once you figure out how, like, if statements and for loops work, then all you need to do is translate it to the text representation of the language that you're using. And mm -hmm. that's a much smaller step than learning the fundamentals of how programming works. Mm. That's why Scratch is so beneficial. Yeah, I, I kind of wish I had known about it when I was younger and when I like before I'd gone yeah. to high school, because I probably would have really liked it then. Because um, I, always, I always liked the idea of programming. I just... I didn't know... I, I think the problem is, like, knowing how to start, knowing what to start with. I know there's going to be someone out there being like, I started programming with C. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I don't I don't care. Like, I oh, know you guys are spoiled. I started in assembly. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Like, Scratch is so good that, like, even CS50, the Harvard course, starts them on Scratch for oh, one week before cool. they go into C. So like they teach them C, but they actually start them on Scratch for a week first so mm -hmm. that they can learn the very basic fundamentals. Huh. That's probably a really good idea then, huh? Yeah, it's incredible. Like I, I keep, I'm like being a shill for Scratch. It's so good. I guess it looks like a kid's toy, so it's like, you know... I mean, it kind of is. If, well, yeah, it is, but it's, it's a kid's toy that has like a, a really good... Like it's it's a really useful learning tool, I guess. And I yeah. guess if you want to know like what's possible with it, like go to the Scratch website and they have like a lot of really cool stuff just being shown off on their homepage. Yeah, I mean people make some pretty incredible things. Uh the most incredible thing I made was I made uh like a little simulator where there were these little people or these little robots that were eating sludge and they just randomly wandered through this area and ate sludge until it was all gone. Mm -hmm. I was really proud of that. But uh, 
the people make full on some people even made 3d games but the most impressive one i ever saw was someone made a fully functional platformer like with a scrolling stage and mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. it was it was truly amazing it's called scratch napped mm. like that was like that just blew my mind when i was a teenager it was like holy moly how did not only how does this work in general but how do they do it in scratch mm -hmm. like it's incredible, yeah. And of course, you wouldn't be surprised, but there are multiple people who have written Doom in Scratch because, of course, oh, they did. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think that's 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 super cool. Like, obviously, that's not the intention of it, and that's people who are just actually really good at programming who are like, I just want to go back and use it. Um, but yeah, if you, I, I guess yeah, if you if you want to get started, it's probably there's probably worse ways to get started, right? Like. I know a lot of people who got started on Python. I know people have gotten started on C. But I guess if you want to just ignore... I guess the syntax is probably the part that's probably relatively scary to a lot of people. Like, if you look at C++, like... What... like Or like C, right? What is a... a what, what is a reference and what is a pointer? Like, why is there an asterisk here? Like, what is that supposed to mean? Like, the... It's not... It, it makes sense if you understand the language, but... When you're getting started, I guess that, that syntax can be a, kind of a barrier to entry. Java is really bad for this as well. Like, um, <laughs> Java is very, very wordy with a lot of stuff. Like, it it has libraries upon libraries upon libraries just for basic things, like system.out.println, just to do a, a printing a string. And, yeah... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's better than C++ where you have to do std colon colon c out left bracket left bracket your string left bracket left bracket std end line just to print something. Yeah, anytime there's a, a, a look at a C++ tutorial, I don't think anyone actually explains what that is. They're just like, oh, just just ignore that. This is just how we do it. Just don't think about it for now. Yeah. It's like in a lot of languages, uh, there's this really dumb uh, metric where like how small is the hello world program? Mm -hmm. In C++, it's uh, like one, two... Two lines minimum, because mm -hmm. uh, you have to import IO stream first, mm -hmm. which has to be its own line, and then you can do your main function and STDC out, yada yada. Uh, whereas in C, it's one line because you can just do int main, and then in your body you just print f. Mm -hmm. uh, in Python, it's just print. In Scratch, it's just say. Uh, it's a really dumb metric, but mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of interesting to think about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's assembly where it's like, okay, well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, we're all spoiled. <laughs> we have functions. Although I guess assembly has routines, but I yeah. don't really know much about assembly. So, Yeah, that would be a, a fun thing to play around with at some point. It's it's not going to be like a productive use of my time. I'm never going to write assembly code for anything actually useful, but it would be nice to go and actually have a, a core understanding of how that stuff fits together. Oh yeah, like one series I highly recommend is Ben Eater. Uh, he made an 8-bit breadboard computer from scratch, uh, including like programming all of the opcodes and stuff by programming them by plugging in wires. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly educational about how l computers actually work at a fundamental level. I highly oh. recommend it. I will definitely, uh, definitely check that out if I have some time. Yeah, and uh, the reason I brought that up is because I want to... He sells a kit where you can build your own, mm -hmm. and I really want to do that but I just haven't gotten around to it because there's so many things I want to do and so many brain cells. Only so many brain cells, like I said before. So much to do, so little time. So much to do, yeah. <laughs> Only 24 hours in a day, it's not enough. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, well, there are, you know, we, we, you're aware of leap seconds. Technically, is a little bit more hey. depending on what <laughs> day it is. Well, hey, we also have the daylight savings. So sometimes my, sometimes my days are an hour shorter or an hour I, longer I for no good reason at all. So much. Like, I, it made sense back when we were all farmers, but now it doesn't really make sense anymore. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But, like, ah, uh, that... The the problem isn't getting getting an extra hour, it's losing the hour that's the problem. Uh yeah. Uh spring forward is the worst. Mm. Fall back is great, you get an extra hour of sleep, but <laughs> spring forward is terrible. Well I don't. Usually I just wake up at my normal time anyway. It's like, hey, it's seven o'clock instead of eight now. What's going on? Uh oh. <laughs> Cause I don't like I have everything just automatically change, so you know, I I don't think about it. Um Yeah. Someone will usually mention it to me, like at work. So like, hey, daylight savings. Like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a thing, isn't it? 
I'm actually quite blessed in that regard too, because uh, like, for example, I'm going to Prague this weekend mm -hmm. uh, for a three week work trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year when I went, I didn't have any jet lag whatsoever. I somehow managed to luck out in such a way that uh, I managed to line everything up perfectly that I didn't suffer from any jet lag. But then recently we flew to Texas to watch the American solar eclipse. And when I came home, it was like maybe a two hour flight mm -hmm. and then only an hour of time difference, but I was completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. Like my body was not happy for several days after that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating how different people can be. And especially even the same person can be different in different circumstances when it comes to your sleep. Yeah, I'm in Australia. So if I go to America, it's going to be like a oh, 15, 16 hour flight. But because of I'm my sorry. time zone, it's going to be, let's say I, leave, I left at like 10 a.m. It'll be like 12 p.m. by the time I get there. So things would just not make any sense. I mean, you could line that up by sleeping on the airplane but That's if you're true. someone who can't sleep on the airplane then you're just hosed yeah yeah <laughs> i do want to go to like things like fostum and uh Gwadek and things like that at some point in the future but it's also just expensive for me to get anywhere because australia right yeah australia is just so remote from everything yeah. well yeah there's some things around you but most of the places where tech happens are uh, in europe and america so yeah we are getting like developing um tech scenes here like we have some we've had stuff in like sydney for a, a long time like PyConf happens in australia for example but we don't have any big linux events here yeah i do want to go to fostem at some point that sounds like fun mm -hmm. i also want to go to gdc mm -hmm. but it's all just time commitment and money commitment yeah yeah well on the topic of time we are closing in on the two hour mark already jeez. <laughs> I was a little worried when we started this. Like, how are we going to fill two hours? But here we are. Yeah. It, 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 you know, most people are kind of worried about it. And then they realize, like, they actually have a lot more to say. And I don't know. But it, as long as you're able to respond to questions with more than three words, uh, usually it goes by pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely have a tendency to ramble. So. Mm -hmm. Like, I wasn't even planning on talking about Cacoon, and then we did that for, what, like 20 minutes? Something like that, yeah. That's the uh, that's what I was saying earlier before we started. I have these topics here. I don't aim to hit them. If we hit them, that's good. Um, but it seems like we pretty much hit everything I wanted to actually mention by the looks of it. Nice, go us. Um, I think the only thing we didn't bring up was the, uh, the whole sway flickering mm. <laughs> with rapidly that's... changing images, but... That's something that I really want to fix because it's it doesn't really affect me, but it's just oh, it's so annoying. Because mm -hmm. uh, even when I'm in tiled mode mm -hmm. on Sway, when the window first appears on the right half of my monitor, it like spazzes for a little bit. Right, right, right. Uh, but when I'm in Prague, I'm gonna work with our graphics guy and hopefully get that fixed. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. I don't know. There's also a real quick lightning round, uh, the SDL clipboard thing that I mentioned, like, oh, we're going to open source our software. Yeah, someone beat me to the punch and already submitted a PR for that because that's taking too long. So oh, nice. Yeah, at least uh, open source solved. is great. <laughs> Doesn't matter who solves it, at least someone solved it. Yeah, at least someone's solving it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess um, let people know uh, where they can find you, where they can find Factorio, and anything else you want to direct people to. Yeah, uh, you can find Factorio on factorio.com. Uh, I recommend buying from us because you get a Steam key anyway, and then all the all we get all the money. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also find it on Steam. Uh, as for me, uh, I'm Rygard. You can find me on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Rygard. I, swim, I stream occasionally, not very often, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the next month. I'm not going to be streaming at all because I'll be away. Mm -hmm. But I'd love for you to hang out if you have some free time. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, but I don't post anything to it. You can find all of my links on my website, uh, rygard.me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, nothing else you want to mention? That's that's pretty much it. Uh, no, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Uh, as for my stuff, uh, I, 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 you know what, we're going to start with that one. I have my gaming channel. I stream twice a week there, uh, probably playing through Sekiro, and I might be doing a collab stream with Ren. We haven't decided on the game yet. This is, uh, I have a backlog, so I don't know what will be happening by the time <laughs> we uh, get there. I have like four podcasts recorded ahead of this, so I need to just stop for a little bit. Um, yeah, the 
main channel is Brody Robertson. I have uh, Linux videos going out there six days a week. Check it out there. There's probably something on Wayland, probably something on various other Linux-related things. If you're listening to the audio version of this, you can find the video version on YouTube at Tech Over T. If you want to find the video... Uh, wait, if you want to find the audio... I, I, this outro is a mess. If you want to find the audio, <laughs> there is an RSS feed. Uh, ch- it's going to be on your favorite podcast platforms. Put in your favorite app, and you're going to be good to go. I'll give you the final word. How do you want to end us? Well, keep on Linuxing, and uh, have a good time. Awesome. See you guys later.